Good morning and welcome to Marvin Nye Methodist Church's Sanctuary Service. Due to the coronavirus, you might notice that things are a little different this morning. The pews are empty, as is the choir loft, as we have heeded the President's National Emergency Declaration and the request of our medical professionals from the community to work to eliminate large gatherings of people while practicing social distancing. Our goal, along with other churches in the community, is to drastically reduce the spread of the COVID-19 virus. As we continue to broadcast on television each Sunday at 10.30 a.m., please know that both the entire traditional and contemporary worship services are live streamed on your computer starting at 11 a.m. You may go to our website, marvinumc.com, or our Facebook pages to find them. We join you in prayer for our community and its health. God bless you and your family. Let's join in. The message is already underway. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostle he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave him many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then he gathered around them and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And after he had said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. And he, they were looking up intently into the sky as he was going. Suddenly, two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, he will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. What a joy to have your faces before me today. For the last two months, I've been preaching to an empty sanctuary. The last two weeks, I've been preaching to cars and windshields with faces behind them. So to see your faces here in church today means so much to me. To see your eyes as you're looking back at me, some of you wearing masks, that's perfectly okay. Encourage that. And uh, just to know that you're here and to see you in church today brings me great joy. As I was thinking about this, I wondered about Jesus when he got back to heaven after his ministry of 33 years on earth. I wonder if he said to his father, Father, what a joy it was to share your word with them and to see their faces aglow and their hearts on fire as they began to understand your love for them and the kingdom of God. And friends, that's what I'm hoping for today. That as we begin to reopen church and as we begin to hear God's word now face to face, that to God will do some beautiful work among us today. Will you pray with me? Lord, in these moments, will you warm our hearts? Will you encourage our spirits? Will you cast out all fear and allow us to trust you as we follow you? For we pray this all in Jesus' name as your word is proclaimed. So bless these words as they're spoken. In Christ's name, amen. So May 24th is actually Aldersgate's day. That's the day when John Wesley's heart was strangely warm in the reading of Galatians after he had had his failed missionary experience in England. And it was the word of God that, that just gave him this amazing kind of conversion that led him to do great ministry for God's kingdom there in England. But today is Ascension Day in the life of the church, the day that we celebrate. It was actually May 21st by church calendar, but today is Ascension Sunday. It's a day when we commemorate that the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth is ending, and he is going to go and take his rightful place in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And as Sarah has done in her children's message this morning, reminding us it's the end of a chapter but it is not the end of the book. The salvation work of God continues, and we are continuing to write the chapters of the work of God in this world today, even in the midst of a pandemic. 
So as one phase of ministry ended in the revelation of God, another one is going to begin. The giving of the Holy Spirit will launch the church that we've come to know and love. So let's recap the story that I shared with you just a moment ago. Jesus spends 40 days following his resurrection from the dead. He's presenting himself, and as the scripture says, if you have your Bible still open, you can see in verse three, he says he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now this, my friends, is what we've been talking about with Easter aftershocks. We've been talking about these encounters with Jesus, these convincing proofs, so that the disciples would know for sure that Jesus Christ was alive. He prayed a blessing of peace over them. He shared a meal and actually ate before them. And he met them on various occasions to reconcile Peter and to take on doubting Thomas and to relieve the doubts that Thomas had. Yes, the revelation continues as Jesus uh, will be with them for 40 more days, kind of shoring up. Now that he's also proven that he's alive, he's going to shore up the teaching of the kingdom of God. That's what the scripture says. It said, for 40 days, he walked among them, he made appearances to them, and he was teaching them about the kingdom of God. And that's what we're gonna focus on today, this idea of this kingdom of God for which we have been called to. I wonder, did he remind them that he had inaugurated, that he had begun the kingdom work right after he was baptized in the River Jordan and he began to preach the word and call people to repentance and people began to follow the kingdom of God at that moment began to grow and be manifest around them? Did he talk with them about things like the Sermon on the Mount, the, the values that we hold as Christians that are so contradictory to the values of the world? Did he talk to them about blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me remind you, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, and blessed are the meek, for they shall see the kingdom of God. Did he remind them as he taught? Because friends, for these 40 days, Jesus seems to do a lot of teaching for the disciples. Maybe he began to talk to them about prayer. Did he go over the Lord's prayer again with them as we have prayed today? Did he talk to them about being salt and light? Did he talk, about them, talk with them about the treasures in heaven being built up? Did he convince them again, do not worry about your life, but seek first the kingdom of God? Did he talk to them about not judging? Did he talk to them about building their faith upon this rock rather than upon the sand? And then there's the classic parables of Jesus. Did he remind them about the parable of the Good Samaritan? Did he talk with them about the mustard seed that starts out so small but then begins to grow? Did he talk to them about the prodigal son who was welcomed home by his father? Did he talk about the great banquet or maybe the pearl of great price? We never really know. The scripture just simply says he talked to them about the kingdom of God. And friends, I want to you to understand something. When you begin to get this kingdom language into your mind, when you begin to see faith and this life that you're living as being a person of the kingdom and that your role is to advance the kingdom of God, it begins to revolutionize the church. It begins to revolutionize your life. The first time I experienced this was in my second appointment in Rockdale, Texas. My lay leader's name was Tom Galbraith. And Tom would always say to me, Doug, is this decision going to advance the kingdom of God? Because I've learned in my life it is the kingdom of God that needs to be growing. It's the kingdom of God that needs to be advanced. We can have a great church, but we most importantly need to be advancing the kingdom of God. Not my will, but God's will be done. Lord, let your kingdom, let it come. Those are the words of a lay leader so long ago as I was in my first appointment as a senior pastor. And friends, the word kingdom of God or kingdom is found 119 times in the four gospels. 
And then when we hit the book of Acts, written by Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, we shouldn't be surprised to find that Jesus, in these 40 days after his resurrection, is talking to the people about the kingdom of God. That's the preaching content, and we find it here right in the scriptures. He appeared to them for a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God that changes all things as we focus on our ministry in the church. Jesus reminding them again that three years prior when he was baptized, he inaugurated the kingdom and now, can you just imagine? They had heard all this teaching before, but now they stand on the other side of his death and resurrection. And how that must have illuminated everything. How it made everything come to life that Jesus had been talking about. He had been talking about making sacrificial choices. He'd been talking about a suffering Messiah. And now on this side of the cross and on this side of the resurrection, friends, sin and death have new meaning because they've been defeated by Jesus. And life means something all new when you're there looking at one who has been raised back to life from the dead. I could just imagine that their eyes were overwhelmed with just this insight and the wisdom as they began to better understand the kingdom of God and the teachings of God. But friends, they were also human. An interesting thing happens in verses four and five as I just read in the scriptures. Jesus begins to talk about the kingdom of God. Jesus begins to talk in verse five about the coming of the Holy Spirit that is gonna come and bring all kinds of amazing things. And where do you think they go in their minds? They go backwards. The scriptures, what did they ask? It's like the disciples began to hear about this coming of the Spirit. Isaiah had talked about in Isaiah 32, that when the coming of the Spirit fell down from heaven, God was going to bring an apocalyptic event and everything was gonna be made new. So in the minds of the disciples for this brief moment, all of a sudden, they're thinking about, oh, we're hearing about kingdom, we're hearing about the Spirit. And you know what happened? National pride began to come back. What's the question they ask? Is this the time that God is going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus is like, guys, you don't get this. I've been spending the last three years teaching you about the kingdom of God. I laid down my life and I've been raised back to life. It's not about a kingdom on this earth. It's about a kingdom in our hearts and it's about a kingdom that will go on forever and ever. It's not about the nation of Israel. It's about God and God's will being done. The kingdom and the spirit brought nationalistic hopes. I wonder if someone in those days would have had a hat that said, make Israel great again. Now, I don't know, but certainly was, that was on their minds. And friends, what I'm saying to you all here today is Jesus had a different idea. The kingdom he was talking about is a kingdom that God is bringing, will usher in forever. And it will come one person at a time. He is not so much talking about an apocalyptic event where the kingdom of God comes down as it will one day upon this earth. He was talking to them at this moment about a mission. And that mission was this. I've been giving you the kingdom. I've been teaching you about the kingdom. And now it's time for you all to go out into all the world. And that's where this commissioning statement comes from and falls in here. He says, you will see power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and to all of Judea and Samaria. You'll be my witnesses to the very ends of the earth. For you see... The kingdom was going to come, and it had come, and it was going to expand through their ministry as the Holy Spirit led them, and it was going to expand and expand, so much so that today we are the benefactors of the kingdom of God coming into our lives. And after, they shared these, after Jesus shared these words, he was then taken up into heaven. We call this the great ascension and a great cloud, just like there was a great cloud, but the children of Israel followed God through the desert. 
just like there was a great cloud that met Mount Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, just like there was a great cloud that was there on the Mount of Transfiguration, God was speaking and he was taking his son back home. As they looked up in the sky, the two angels appeared and said, what are you looking at? As he goes, so he will come back one day. So friends, while they were looking backwards about a nationalistic kingdom, and then they began to look upwards watching Jesus be ascended, what Jesus was wanting them to do was what I want you to do, begin to look forward. Begin to look forward to the advancement of this kingdom through every conversation, through every uh, act of kindness, through everything that is done to reach those who do not yet know about God's love. That's how the kingdom of God is expanded. What do we learn from this Easter aftershock? What do we learn from these very last words of Jesus on this earth? The word, the, what we learn, friends, is this. The work has been done, completed by Christ. The death has occurred to atone for the sins of all humanity. It is finished. And now Jesus can go back to sit at the right hand of our Heavenly Father. You are fully equipped to do what God has called you to do to advance the kingdom. 40 days. I used to think 40 days was, well, a nice number. And then I began to discover 40 days, and, and I found out, and of course, I knew out of seminary that 40 days meant, you know, completeness. It was a, a whole number that's found, though, 157 times in the scriptures. 40 is significant. It can be seen also through the lens of equipping. The very fact that Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai before he, was, before he would receive the Ten Commandments. Elijah would wander for 40 days as a sad, depressed prophet who had been, uh, even though he'd had a great victory, was being chased by King, uh, Queen Jezebel and was in a very sad place. For 40 days he wandered before God would meet him on Mount Horeb. The people of God wandered for 40 days in the wilderness and Jesus would pray and fast for 40 days before his ministry. And then I begin to realize that 40 is also a season of preparation. And for those 40 days, what was Jesus doing? He was preparing those disciples to go and start the next chapter. And that is the gospel getting out into the world, going to all the places of the world. And we'll talk more about that as we get into Pentecost next Sunday. But friends, sometimes we get stuck. You know, when Jesus said to the disciples in verse four, you all wait here in Jerusalem until the Father gives you the Spirit. I think sometimes we mishear that and we just decide we're just gonna wait here in the church. We're gonna wait here until we hear enough good sermons. We're gonna wait here until we feel like we're better equipped. We're gonna wait here until our lives are better that we can be a better witness for God. But Jesus has said, the work's done. You're equipped. You've got the story. You take it out to the world. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. Christian author Gordon MacDonald reminds us, we know more than enough to be witnesses for God in the world today. And yet we kind of convince ourselves we just need one more study, one more Bible study, one more sermon. We just keep showing up when God has said, it's time to take the message out. The problem is we too can get stuck looking inward when Jesus is calling us to begin to look outward. Winston Churchill wrote, had a radio address and. 1941, February 9th. He was encouraged by President Roosevelt as the war with Germany was going on, and Roosevelt sent him a quote from American poet Henry Longfellow. These were the words. Roosevelt says, Sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union strong and great. Humanity with all its fears, with all its hopes, and with all its future years is hanging breathless at thy fate. But the answer of Churchill back to Roosevelt were these words. Put your confidence in us. Give us your faith and give us your blessing. We shall not fail and we will not falter. 
We shall not weaken and we will not tire. Neither the sudden shock of battle nor the long drawn trials of vigilance or exertion will wear us down. Give us the tools, Mr. President, and we will finish the job. I love that quote. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. That gives me a segue just to say thank you for those families represented today and those watching online who have lost loved ones who we memorialize this weekend. Those who've given the lives the ultimate sacrifice so that the tyranny of others will end and the world can be liberated and made free. And what was Winston Churchill saying to our president at that time? Give us the tools, we'll get it done. And I think, friends, the message I want you to hear today is God has given us the tools. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the gospel. And he's telling us, go get it done. And what I want us to hear this morning is pandemic or no pandemic, we're gonna step up to this generation that needs to hear the gospel. We're gonna step into the lives of those who are suffering and those who have lost their hope. And we're gonna share with them the love of Christ and the hope of the gospel of Jesus. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, with God's help, we'll get the job done. So friends, Ascension Sunday is so very important. It's a reminder to all of us that Jesus did what he came to do. He completed the mission and now he waits for us to again receive the Holy Spirit so that we can take the mission out, out from Jerusalem, out from Tyler, Texas, to where God is calling us to share with others. That's what ascension means to me. The mission was completed. Yes, Jesus is interceding with the Father. He's sitting at the right hand. He has all authority, and one day he will come back. He's gone to prepare a place for us and he will come back and claim us and the kingdom of God will one day come upon this earth. That's what scripture says. That's the urgency by which we must be working to get this work done that God has given us. But I must close with an illustration. You know, you've been hearing me preach for seven years and you know when I work in the yard, God talks to me. We were working in Rebecca and Trey's yard in Waco, Hewitt area, planting some plants in the flower bed. Flower bed. My wife, Jean, is here. She's the landscape architect, though she also gets involved. She works a hoe and a shovel. But let me tell you, I found something out today. The soil in Hewitt, Texas, at least around their home, is this. Clay and limestone. Gina had laid out where she wanted the plant to go. I'm there with my shovel and my hoe, and I start working, and about two or three inches in, I hit limestone. I've hit this before, she is well. This is a rough place to work, but we had a plan. We were gonna dig out a nice area, a nice trough in these flower beds. We were gonna put in the topsoil, the manure, the compost. We were gonna give these plants the best chance they had to grow. Then I hit this this limestone, and I dug, and I dug, and I pulled, and I finally got it out. And friends, I have brought it with me today because you would not believe, I am serious, this limestone was right where the plant was supposed to go, two inches down beneath the clay. And there's no way this plant would have had a chance if that limestone had stayed. You wanna see it? I don't know how much this weighs. I'm guessing 15 pounds. And what I wanna teach you about with this illustration is the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ removes the sin of stone and prepares our hearts so that the gospel of Jesus can come in with the nutrients of a good soil and the compost, and allow something beautiful to be birthed out of your life. I hope you know this truth. I hope you've experienced this. 
There is hard work that must be done to remove the stones out of our hearts so that Jesus can come in and put in something beautiful and give it the nutrients and the good soil that it needs to to come to life again. But you know what? Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Like a parable about soils and the kingdom of God and the soil that had rock to which something could not grow and the good fertile soil that took the seed and let it grow and multiply. I pray for each of you this morning that your heart is fertile for God, that the word of God and the kingdom of God will come alive inside of you and beautiful fruit will begin to be born out of the plants that God can grow there because Jesus has been crucified, dead, and buried, but he rose again. And friend, when he rose again, that means your sins can be forgiven and it means that those rocky places can be removed. And that would be my prayer for you. And that would be my prayer for all who are in fear in this pandemic, all who feel uh, uh, uncomfortable, those who are struggling, those who are sick, those who are dealing with financial difficulties, that we as a church will share with them the message and the hope of God. All made possible because Jesus loves you and he came to this earth and died for you. And when completing the mission, has gone back to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And one day, we will all bow the knee, declaring he is Lord of all. I hope you already are worshiping him as your Lord. And if not, we want to talk to you about that. Ascension Sunday. What a great Sunday in the church. Often gets overlooked, doesn't it? We talk about his birth at Christmas. We talk about Good Friday and his death. We talk about Easter and his resurrection, but we kind of miss out on the ascension that he's, the work is done. The message has been shared. The kingdom teachings have been given. So church, let's get it done. We've got the tools. Let's get it done. Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you. Thank you for your word that speaks into our hearts. Thank you for the message today that reminds us that the work has been done. Lord, the Holy Spirit's coming. We celebrate that next week, but the Lord, the Holy Spirit is already in our midst, already wooing us and calling us and equipping us to go out and to reach others in Jesus' name. So Lord, give us boldness and courage so that we can get it done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I hope that you'll visit our website to learn more about our church and its ministry and serving opportunities. If we can be of any assistance to your spiritual growth, I hope that you'll contact us. If you'd like to contribute to support the television ministry of Marvin, please contact Robin Thomason through the information provided on the screen. May God bless you.